MySQL requires resources when executing a query. In this section, we cover the best practices for configuring these resources and the most important configuration options that must be changed from the default values. Also, we'll go through an overview of the data lifecycle in InnoDB so that we have background knowledge when making configuration changes. When you plan to make configuration changes, it's worth having a few principles in mind which can make you more successful at tuning the configurations. The best practices that will be discussed include the following. Use monitoring to verify the effect, change one option at a time, make relatively small incremental changes, and consider the side effects. When we see some advice, we shouldn't jump straight ahead and apply it. While some advices may be good in general, no two systems are identical. So, we need to consider whether it applies to our system. Another catch is to verify if the advice apply to an older system of MySQL or to a time when 8 gigs of memory was a lot. If you google some settings, it is possible that you see some recommendations that were written many years ago. Similarly, a recommendation that worked well for your system some time ago may no longer work due to the changes in the application workload. Finally, even if a recommendation will improve the performance for your system, there may be side effects, such as the risk of loss of committed changes, which are unacceptable for you. So first, we start out defining what the issue is. Then, we collect the baseline, either through our monitoring system or by timing the query or similar. The baseline may also be a combination of observables. Then, we can define the goal of the optimization. It's very important that we define what is good enough or we will never be done. Please observe that monitoring is very important in this process as it is used to define the problem, to collect the baseline and to verify the effect. When we decide on a solution, we should make the change as small as possible. This applies both to how far we turn the knobs and to the number of configuration options that we turn the knobs on. If we change more than one option at a time, we can't measure the effect of each change. For example, two changes may cancel each other out, so we think the solution didn't work when, in fact, one of the changes really worked and the other made the situation worse. Also, configuration options often have a sweet spot. If the setting change is too small, the option modification may not be enough to make a significant impact. If the setting is too large, the overhead of the feature becomes worse than the benefit. Somewhere in between, you have the optimal combination of the benefit of the feature while the overhead is limited. By making small incremental changes, we maximize the chance of finding this sweet spot. This relates to the next point. Small is often better. For example, just because we have enough memory to increase the buffer per query or the buffer per join doesn't mean it makes the queries faster. Such buffers, as the one for join, may be allocated several times for a single query and even the sheer overhead of allocating the buffer can become a problem. On the other hand, for the buffer pool, memory allocation happens only when MySQL starts or when we dynamically increase the size of the buffer pool. After we determine the solution, we have to implement it. Finally, we verify the effect. In all cases, for options that relate to resources, we need to remember that the resources we allocate for one feature are not available for the others. Therefore, the recommendation is to start out setting as few options as possible. With this in mind, we would likely want to set the size of the InnoDB buffer pool, the redo log, and possibly the table caches. The rest of this section provides some recommendations for the options related to query tuning that most often need to be changed. Given that all queries interact with InnoDB storage engine, it is important to take some time to look at the configuration of the InnoDB parameters. These include the size of the InnoDB buffer pool, 
and the size of the redo log, two configurations that need to be adjusted for most production systems. Before discussing the configuration options, it is worth reviewing how the data flows between the table spaces and the buffer pool and back to the table spaces using the redo log system. When a query requests data, it is always read from the buffer pool. If the data is not already in the buffer pool, it is fetched from the table spaces. InnoDB divides the buffer pool into two parts, the old blocks sublist and the new blocks sublist. Data is always read into the head or top of the old blocks in whole pages. If data from the same page is required again, the data is moved to the new blocks. Both sublists use the least recently used principle to determine which pages to expel when it is necessary to create room for a new page. Pages are evicted from the buffer pool from the old blocks sublist. Since new pages spend time in the old blocks, before being promoted to the new blocks, it means that if a page is used once but then left unused, then it will quickly be expelled from the buffer pool again. This prevents large rare scans, such as backups, from polluting the buffer pool. When there is an update, the changes are written to the in-memory log buffer and from there written and later flashed to the redo log, which consists of at least two files. The redo log files are used in a circular fashion. Thus, writes start at the beginning of one file and then fill up the page and when it's full, InnoDB continues with the next file. The files are fixed in size and with a fixed number of files. When the log reaches the end of the last file, InnoDB moves back to the beginning of the first file. The changes are also written back to the buffer pool and mark as dirty until they can be flushed to the table space files. InnoDB uses the double write buffer to ensure that it is possible to detect whether a write was successful or not in case of a crash. The double write buffer is necessary because most file systems don't guarantee atomic writes and because InnoDB page is larger than the file system block size. At the time of this lecture, the only file system where it's safe to disable the double write buffer is ZFS. The InnoDB buffer pool is where InnoDB caches data and indexes. Since all requests for data go through the buffer pool, it naturally becomes a very important part of MySQL from a performance perspective. There are a few important parameters for the buffer pool that will be discussed here. This table summarizes the buffer pool related configuration options that you most likely need to change to optimize the query performance. The most important of these options is the size of the buffer pool. The default size of 128 megabytes is nice for setting up a test instance on your laptop without draining off your memory. This is why the default value is so small. But for production systems, you most likely want to allocate more memory. We can check the size for the buffer pool at runtime by verifying InnoDB buffer pool size variable. Show global variables like InnoDB buffer pool size. The value is represented in bytes and if we convert it, we get 128 megabytes. We can benefit from increasing the size until our working dataset fits into the buffer pool. The working dataset is the data that is needed by all queries executing. Typically, this is only a subset of the total dataset as some data is inactive, for example, because it concerns events in the past. As a result, we can get the buffer pool hit rate, that is, how frequently a page request can be fulfilled directly from the buffer pool without reading from disk using the following formula. The two variables are status variables and we can get them using the following query. We take note of their values and then we can calculate the hit rate. 
We should aim at having the buffer pool heat rate as close to 100% as possible. That said, in some cases it is simply not possible as the amount of data cannot possibly fit into memory. In that case, the buffer pool heat rate is still useful, as it allows us to monitor the effectiveness of the buffer pool over time and compare it to the general query statistics. If the buffer pool heat rate starts to drop with a degradation in query performance, we should look at making provisions so that the buffer pool can be increased in size. To increase the buffer pool size, we can use set global inodb buffer pool size and we will set it to 1 GB. Note that global variables affect the overall operation of the server and session variables affect its operation for individual client connections. Also, you can use set persist in ODB buffer pool size and then the value. Here, the capability of persisting global variables at runtime enables server configuration to persist across server startups. MySQL has supported multiple buffer pool instances since version 5.5. The reason for introducing it was that typical database workloads had more and more queries running in parallel and with more and more CPU per host. This led to mutex contention when accessing the data from the buffer pool. One of the solutions to reduce contention is to allow the buffer pool to be split into multiple instances with different mutexes for each instance. Thus, the total amount of the buffer pool specified with InnoDB buffer pool size is divided evenly among the instances. The number of instances is controlled with the option InnoDB buffer pool instances. The default is to have one instance for a buffer pool size of less than 1 GB. For larger buffer pools, the default is 8 instances and the maximum number of instances is 64. However, for a single threaded workload, it's optimal to have all of the memory in a single buffer pool. The more parallel your workload is, the more additional instances help reduce contention. Still, the exact effect of increasing the number of buffer pools depends on the extent the parallel queries request data stored in different pages. If all requests are for different pages, you can benefit from increasing the instances towards the number of concurrent queries. However, if all queries request data in the same page, there is no benefit of having more instances. Then, be careful not to make each buffer pool instance too small. For example, if you set your total size for the buffer to 8 GB large, you can set each instance to 1 GB by setting the instances number to 8. One of the common problems with restarts of a database is that caching doesn't work well for a while until the cache has been warmed up. This can lead to very poor query performance and poor end user satisfaction. The solution to this is to store a list of the most frequently used pages in the buffer pool at shutdown. Then, read these pages back into the buffer pool immediately after a restart, even if no queries have made requests to them yet. So, if you encounter problems with slow queries after a restart, consider increasing InnoDB buffer pool dump percentage to include a larger part of the buffer pool into the dump. However, consider the main drawbacks of increasing the option. The shutdown takes longer as more pages are exported and it takes longer to load the pages after the restart. Although loading the pages back into the buffer pool happens in the background, including more pages may take longer. To recap, when there is a write happening, MySQL will write both to the table spaces and to the redo logs. When changes are merged and written to the table spaces, the redo logs are marked as applied up to that point. Normally, the merging is done by flashing dirty pages from the buffer pool to the table space files 
except during a crash recovery or after restoring a physical backup. In case of a crash, pages will no longer be available in the buffer pool, so they will be read from the redo logs instead. Now, InnoDB needs to balance how hard it works at merging the changes into the table space files. If it's too lazy, the redo logs ends up being full and the force flash is required. But if it works too hard, it can impact the performance of other parts of the system. Needless to say, it's complex to get the equation right. However, in recent MySQL versions, you don't need to do as much in general. The adaptive flash algorithm that InnoDB uses is good at striking a good balance as long as there is enough redo log to work with. There are primarily two options to consider. The first option for the IO capacity is InnoDB underscore IO underscore capacity and it's used during normal flashing of changes. This should be set to the number of IO operations that InnoDB is allowed to use per second. In practice, it's not very easy to know what value to use. However, the default, which is 200, corresponds to a low-end SSD. Usually, high-end storage can benefit from setting the capacity to a few thousand. Still, it's better to start out with a relatively low value and increase it if your monitoring shows that flashing is falling behind and there is spare I.O. capacity. Since this is a dynamic variable, it can be set at runtime using set persist in ODB I.O. capacity and we set it to 1000. The second option, InnoDB IO Capacity Max, tells how hard InnoDB is allowed to push if flashing is falling behind. Note that these two options are used to determine how quickly InnoDB flashes dirty pages to the table space files. The redo log is a disk based data structure used during crash recovery to correct data written by incomplete transactions. Modifications that didn't finish updating the data files before an unexpected shutdown are replayed automatically during initialization and before the connections are accepted. The redo log provides sequential I.O., which means it only has to write data as it comes without the need to look up where the rows are located as it would be on the table spaces. To improve the performance even further, Changes are first written to the in-memory log buffer before they are written to the log files. This allows transactions to keep the changes in memory until the buffer is full or until the changes are committed. The default size of the log buffer is 16 MB. If you have large transactions or a high number of smaller concurrent transactions, it is recommended to increase the size of the log buffer. A large buffer enables large transactions to run without the need to write the log to disk before the transactions commit. Thus, if you have transactions that update, insert or delete many rows, making the log buffer larger saves a lot of disk I.O. Log buffer size is configured using the option InnoDB log buffer size, which can be modified dynamically in MySQL 8. Optimally, the buffer should be large enough that InnoDB only has to write out the changes before they are committed. However, this could be weighted against what the memory can otherwise be used for. Make your redo log files big, even as big as the buffer pool. When InnoDB has written the redo log files full, it must write the modified content of the buffer pool to disk in a checkpoint. The larger the value, the less checkpoint flash activity is required in the buffer pool, saving disk I.O. Small redo log files cause many unnecessary writes. Although historically, big redo log files caused very long recovery times, recovery is now much faster and you can confidently use large redo log files. You control the size with these two configuration options.
The total redulog size is the product of the two values. Since these are not dynamic variables, we can't change the number or the size of the redulog files at runtime. So, we need to perform the following steps. First, we need to edit the file my.cnf to change the log file configuration. You can find this file in the installation path of MySQL. However, there is no internal MySQL command to trace the installation path as it depends on how you installed MySQL. In my case, I have the config file at slash usr slash local slash etc. Then I'll use the nano tool to open and edit the file. To change the default value, we add inodb log file size and I'll set it to 256 megabytes. To increase the number of log files, we add inodb log files in group. And I'll set this one to 4 files. Then, to apply the changes, I need to restart the MySQL server and make sure that it shuts down and starts without errors. What will happen is that if InnoDB detects that the config option redo log file size differs from the actual redo log file size, it writes a log checkpoint, closes and removes the old log files, creates new log files of requested size, and opens the new log files. Since MySQL 8.0.14 InnoDB added limited support for executing a query in parallel. You can configure the maximum number of threads that InnoDB can create for parallel execution across all connections by setting the option InnoDB Parallel Read Threads. The default is 4 threads and they are created as background threads and are only present when needed. If all parallel threads are in use, InnoDB will revert to a single threaded execution for any additional queries until threads are available again. As of MySQL 8.0.22, the parallel scan are used for select count, here multiple tables are allowed without any filter conditions, and for the second of the two scans performed by check table. You can see the current usage of parallel threads from the performance schema threads table by looking for threads with the name thread slash inodb slash parallel read thread as in the following query. As usual, it is available in the description. Of course, if you see that all the configured read threads are in use most of the time and you have spare CPU, you can consider increasing the value of inodb parallel read threads. MySQL uses several buffers during query execution. These include a buffer for storing column values used in a join, a buffer for sorting, and more. It is tempting to think that more is better for these buffers, but it is not the case in general. Often, less is better. There are few cases where, if the buffer is not large enough, the algorithm can perform at its most optimal as more iterations are needed or it is necessary to overflow to disk. Normally, the configured value of a buffer serves as a minimum size rather than the maximum size. This is, for example, the case with join buffer. The minimum size is always allocated and if it's not large enough to hold columns needed for a single row when using a join, then it will be expanded as required. The question about memory is also very relevant. The amount of memory required for various buffers may not seem to add up too much for a single query, but if you then multiply all the concurrently executing queries 
and add the memory required for idle connections and the global allocations, you may suddenly be closer to being out of memory. Probably the most common reason for which MySQL crashes is that the operating system is out of memory and the operating system kills MySQL. This may also lead to swapping, which is a major performance killer. The conclusion is that it's better to be conservative with the buffers that are allocated for the duration of a query. Keep the global setting small, for instance, the default values are good starting point and increase only for the queries where you can demonstrate that there is a significant improvement when increasing the setting. In this section, we went through the general consideration of configuring a MySQL instance and the options that most commonly need adjustment. First, we checked how we can approach MySQL configuration changes by considering some best practices so that we can successfully tune MySQL. Then, we seen the three options that MySQL is most likely to benefit from non-default values and also how to set them. This included settings for core components such as InnoDB buffer pool and the redo logs. We discussed as well parameters that are important for certain use cases, for instance, the number of buffer pool instances for high concurrent workloads and how to make use of parallel execution for certain queries.